<clears throat> Hi guys, my name is Carly. Sometimes I also go by Carly Anna and today we're going to be talking about tornadoes. And tornadoes, 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 tornadoes in other countries, passing tornadoes, and I really like tornadoes. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about one of the most infamous and certainly one of the most disturbing tornadoes in modern history and that is of course the Gerald Texas tornado of 1997. In this discussion we'll analyze the atmospheric conditions, the tornado coverage itself, the aftermath and devastation. All of the information I'm going to be using today will be linked in the description. There are several documentaries that have been done and there is a 20 year anniversary documentary that has also been done by several news outlets. So without further ado, this is the Gerald Texas Dead Men Walking Tornado. I am definitely reading off of a script that I wrote. So if my eyes wonder you, <laughs> you know why. <laughs> An ancient Native American legend speaks of the dead man walking. If you see him in a tornado, you are about to die. The townsfolk of Gerald can now see the arms and legs of a multi-vortex tornado approaching. The dead man has just walked into Gerald. In the year 1997, Gerald, Texas is a cozy town in Williamson County nestled between Austin and Dallas-Fort Worth, with a population just over 400. With just one elementary, middle, and high school, school-aged children are close and most families know one another. The people of Gerald and Texas in general are no stranger to the idea of a tornado or even an outbreak of tornadoes, particularly in May. Texas averages more than 100 tornadoes every year. That's more than twice as many as any other state. The events preceding the Gerald tornado are somewhat of an enigma. In fact, it's impossible to talk about the Gerald tornado and not discuss the dynamics. The parameters for this outbreak alone are far from a traditional meteorological setup. On the days leading into the event itself, a system of low pressure began sweeping its way across the plains, slowly moving southward. This system, to note, was neither well-defined nor particularly strong, which is not really conducive to tornado genesis. So generally speaking, tornadoes need four main ingredients to live and thrive off of, and those are shear, lift, instability, and moisture two of which the system distinctly lacked, and that was upper-level lift and surface-based shear. Also ahead of the cold front, a dry line creeping over Texas, nearly stalling out, and would eventually meet up with this cold front. Upon this collision, the air would squeeze between the two, helping to create a more volatile and explosive atmosphere. The process of this cold front and dry line meeting can actually be seen over satellite imagery and you will see the explosion of convection, which is pretty cool. So now, despite the fact that we were initially missing the two main ingredients, upper level lift and wind shear on the surface, the collision of the two boundaries would actually help give us the missing shear that we needed to help create and maintain tornadoes. Out ahead of the cold fronts, temperature and dew points were in the low to mid 70s. The heat and moisture prevalent in the late spring months make Texas a hotspot for Cape, instability that storms live and thrive off of, which is conducive to storm production. The Cape on this day wasn't just present, it was extreme, in excess of 7,000 joules per kilogram. To put that into perspective, 2,000 joules per kilogram is enough for tornado potential, 4,000 joules per kilogram is considered extreme by the National Weather Service. So for this event, you had over 7,000, which is an explosive amount of cape. This is what's referred to as a high cape, low shear event. High cape, low shear events have caused violent tornadoes in the past. So this isn't the first time that it occurred, but it is notably rare. Meteorologists like David Imey watched it build. We had very cold temperatures aloft and very warm and moist conditions near the surface, which resulted in a very unbalanced, unstable atmosphere. 
now forecasters the day before are increasingly aware that there's a threat for severe weather. With the low pressure system and explosive cape values, meteorologists knew that the atmosphere was extremely volatile and any storms along the dry line and cold front meetup would be severe and eventually decided to issue a moderate risk for severe weather at 1 a.m. the night preceding the event, which is the second highest risk possible for Central Texas, which included Williamson County. In the early hours of May 27th, 1997, the morning was thick with hot, wet air with a surface analysis showing dew points in the high 70s. Holy cow. The SPC decided to issue a tornado watch for the region, which included Williamson County in central Texas at 12.54 p.m. Now the weather service will begin a tornado watch. A watch can cover an area of up to 40,000 square miles and can last for up to six hours. Storm initiation occurred around Waco, Texas. We can see the thunderstorm developed around 1 p.m. south of Waco, Texas and actually moved southwestward along this uh, cold front that was stationary. The storm approached a town called Lorena, Texas, warranting the first tornado warning at 1.21 p.m. News bulletins began broadcasting the first tornado warning of the day. Coming out of Hewitt. More will follow. Right there. Moving out towards Interstate 35, so from Hewitt to... The weatherman makes no mention of Gerald. It does not at present appear to be in the tornado's path. Meteorologists use radar to track the storm. Suddenly, it changes direction. It's now heading straight for Gerald. After a series of touchdowns along the way, the storm finally reaches Gerald and produces a small tornado just outside of the town, where the final tornado warning is issued before entering the city. San Antonio has issued a tornado warning, effective until 4.30 p.m. for people in Williamson County in South Central Texas. Initially, this tornado was a very thin pencil-like tornado looking relatively weak and really not tearing up anything other than crops. It's largely away from homes and businesses and frankly some of the best tornado footage I have ever seen in my life. It's around this point where we can see the tornado begin to rapidly increase in size only a few short minutes after it touched down. This is also the point where we will get the infamous image of what looks to be the tornado walking into Gerald and where it would get its dead man walking name. So if you live in northern Williamson County, particularly in the Jarrell area right now, it is time to seek shelter from this approaching tornado. This uh, tornado will likely move across the Jarrell area. You folks in Jarrell need to take your tornado precautions at this time. Eyewitnesses and film show this small pencil-like tornado rapidly intensify into a large half-mile wide violent tornado in a matter of literally seconds. For the people of Jarrell, time has started to run out. 190. Tornado sirens had begun to sound about 10 minutes before the circulation actually reached Jarrell, and the people of Jarrell were really no stranger to tornado procedures. In fact, many of them rushed home to get into their shelters or safe spots in their closet or bathroom, which is just as the NWS instructs you to do. As the tornado widened, it crossed over County Road 305 and eventually onto County Road 307, where F5 damage quickly began to occur. 
and now this video that we have shot this afternoon, uh, Stacy, has been uh, is playing all around the country. This is becoming a very large uh, news story, and the videotape that I told you a few minutes ago looks to me to be F3, F4 at least. Uh, he tells me that uh, this storm to him looks a whole lot like one was rated F5. And it's at this point that the tornado takes its final turn into Double Creek subdivision. The now massive three quarter mile wide tornado was barreling straight for the residents of Double Creek. And at 3.48 p.m., it's believed to have struck the first home. And eerily enough, a specific time is known because the first home had a clock that was found several miles away that was permanently frozen at 3.48 p.m., which is really disturbing. It's at this point when the tornado hits Double Creek subdivision that the tornado reaches its peak intensity, its maximum width at three quarters of a mile wide and slows down to nothing more than a crawl. The tornado churned over the Double Creek subdivision, sandblasting and grinding the homes to virtually nothing as it sat over this one subdivision for two to three minutes. After what seemed like an eternity, the tornado would eventually move past the Double Creek subdivision and cross County Road 309, which was a heavily wooded area before finally lifting up after a total of 13 minutes on the ground in Gerald. Right after the tornado lifts, neighbors and emergency personnel were horrified to discover that the Double Creek subdivision wasn't just devastated, it was gone. It was completely gone. The Associated Press reporting, as Stacy reported to you a few minutes ago, that the, the damage is incredible and that uh, the city has been, I believe Stacy's words were, level. It's unquestionable that violent F4, F5 tornadoes cause catastrophic damage and have wiped homes from their foundation in the past, but generally where there's large damage, there is large debris to accompany it. Part of the problem with the Gerald Tornado was its slow forward velocity across the Double Creek Estates. Normally, we think of tornadoes perhaps raking across the ground 60 miles an hour. In this case, it was only moving forward at, at a rate of about one to two miles per hour for about 10 to 15 minutes. And so all of that debris, the wheat, the mud, uh, the, the shrapnel from cars, the debris from homes simply churning in place minute after minute without uh, reprieve and for that reason the Double Creek Estates was simply wiped off the map. It didn't just pass through Double Creek it sat over Double Creek and any of the debris that would have had a chance to be left over didn't just get blown it was literally ground into rubble and dust. There were no appliances left. 
there were no cars left. There was not even large pieces of home or wood or drywall left. In some instances, the plumbing had even been ripped out of the foundation of the home. And out of the several dozen vehicles that had once existed in the Double Creek residence, none were to be found within a quarter or half a mile vicinity of the neighborhood. Trees were completely debarked and nothing was left. Emergency personnel who worked the event after would report any debris found either over half a mile away were marred beyond recognition, which is indicative of the extreme winds here. It became apparent that what had happened to Gerald was an F5. The ground was literally shaved. The asphalt was sucked up. It takes a lot of force to be able to suck up asphalt. The full extent of the damage could be seen from the air. Professor Don Green of Baylor University surveyed the trail of devastation left by the tornado in its wake. Out of the 27 fatalities that occurred in Gerald on that day, all 27 of them occurred in the Double Creek Estates neighborhood. 13 of those being children and young adults. In fact, many of the people who passed in this tornado were people who came home to be with their family and to shelter in place as is instructed of them by the NWS. Covering themselves with pillows and cushions as protection against falling debris. Tragically, the Gerald tornado was moving so slowly and with such power that following the official advice was probably the most dangerous course of action to take. We're going to talk about the fatalities and I am not going to show any people, but there are some images of animals and descriptions of the fatalities. So if you, if you don't want to listen to the gruesome nature of the fatalities, which I completely understand, I would advise you not listen to the next part and rather to skip ahead. The recovery process immediately after this event was long and difficult for everyone and that is the families that's the emergency personnel and frankly the entire community out of the several documentaries and interviews in almost none of those can you find emergency personnel willing to discuss what happened or what they saw on that day the information that is available however is just as disturbing it's been said that the bodies were extremely hard to identify, often needing to be pieced together, and at times unable to be differentiated from the over 300 livestock that were also killed in the tornado. Many of the victims had to be identified via dental records. Whew. This herd was vaulted into the air, picked up, whirled around, bounced along the ground many times so that the animals had broken legs. In terms of uh, the, the exposure to the wind itself, often the uh, cattle lost their, their hair. They were skinned. Often what you would see is something like uh, meat in a butcher shop. In some cases, what you saw was mostly skeleton. The effect of such force on a human body is best left to the imagination. Tim Marshall, a meteorologist and civil engineer who was one of the many who assessed the damage, said basically they found a finger over here, a wrist over there, and were able to try to piece back together the people literally to try to identify them. He goes on to say the bodies were mangled, their clothes ripped, off and their skin burned by the friction of the 300 mile per hour winds. Billy Williams 
who was also part of the search and rescue process in an interview has said, I knew these people and I could barely recognize them. It was hard to take and I had to leave. And, you know, you can just imagine the trauma of being part of this search and rescue process. In many cases, families had to wait for days before bodies were able to be identified. This included two entire families, the Moring family and the Ego family. And if I mispronounce those, please forgive me. The Carol tornado alone killed more than died all across the country during the entire tornado season last year. Robert Hager, NBC News, Washington. There were survivors from the Double Creek subdivision. One family had built an underground shelter in their home and that was because they had previously gone through a tornado. And so that family and the next door neighbor family safely sheltered in their underground basement. But again, that's just kind of a testament to how strong this tornado was that they had to be underground. The path of the tornado went through the Hernandez home. Now, on this side of his house, five people were killed. The tornado went through this way, over their shelter, and across the street, killing three people in that home as well. In another instance, a family had actually driven, they saw the tornado coming and had actually driven out of its way, its path, which is not generally recommended, but they did survive. So in total, the surveying of this tornado would rate it as an F5. The EF scale that we use now, the Enhanced Fujita Scale, wasn't implemented until 2007. And so tornadoes prior to 2007, like in this instance, are referred to as F5. So this tornado was classified as an F5 with max speeds over 260 miles an hour. And I believe this storm reached 261 miles per hour peak winds, which is absolutely phenomenal. All in all, the storm accrued $40 million in damage by 1997 standards, $100,000 in crop damage, and an obvious priceless amount on the, the lives that were lost. Of this entire outbreak, there would be over 20 tornadoes. 30 deaths, of course, 27 of those happened in Gerald. One in Padernal's Valley, a 25-year-old man died in a mobile home. One in Cedar Park, a man 69 years of age who passed away of cardiac arrest. And one woman in Austin, uh, 38 years old, who drowned in a swollen creek. Some of the members of the football team were victims. The first football game that we had without the boys was an emotional game. 27 people's lives were gone, and the final score of our game was 27. If there's one thing to say about the people of Jeryl, it's how incredibly strong they are. Even after all the devastation the town faced, they still found reasons to hold on to hope. There's a photo of the tornado that resembles a portrait of Jesus, which people believe that despite all the horror they went through, God was still with them. And you really have to commend them, even if you aren't religious, holding on to their faith in the face of such adversity. Gerald has since rebuilt. Many of the homes, even in the Double Creek estates, were rebuilt, minus two that chose to never rebuild and are still concrete slabs to this day. There is a memorial now and it's called the Gerald Memorial Park. And as of 2021, Gerald, Texas has a population over 2,000 which is really incredible. I mean, there are many instances where tornadoes will damage cities of this size and really just becomes a ghost town. So the fact that Gerald in 2021 is doing well is really heartwarming. So overall, what happened in Gerald, Texas was just as disturbing as it was anomalous. The Gerald tornado distinguishes itself not only because of its ferocity, but because it opened up so much dialogue about existing tornado safety precautions and protocols. Despite people knowing what they were supposed to do in this instance, most of them didn't make it. The only case people survived was a family who drove away and a family who sheltered underground. It really started a lot of healthy discussions, in my opinion, about 
the existing safety protocols, do we need to change them? Are these recommendations by the NWS valid? So after all of that information, and I know it was a lot, I'd like to open the discussion. I'd be really interested to know what your tornado plan is. Um, how seriously you take these tornado events when you get a tornado warning? Do you actually go into a closet? Do you have a storm shelter and kind of what your preparations are in case of an event? I'd be I would really love to know if you're not familiar with the FEMA guidelines and what the NWS recommends for tornado safety I will also put in the description what you are supposed to do in case of a tornado. I live in the deep south so it's kind of necessary for someone like me but I think everyone should know just in case. I'll link that down below. Um, thank you so much for watching. I had a lot of fun researching and talking about this event and I would absolutely love to hear what you guys thought about it. So thank you so much. I'll see you next time. The Gerald Tornex Tornexus. The Gerald Tornexus. <laughs> if you are part of the weather community, hi Blaze. <laughs>